Welcome to a New Mexico PBS Election 2020 special as we sit down with the candidates in the race for the state's third congressional district. Republican Alexis Martinez Johnson and Democrat Teresa Ledger Fernandez. I'm New Mexico in Focus host Gene Grant. For the first time in over a decade, the third congressional district will soon have a new representative. Congressman Ben Ray Lujan has held the seat since 2008, but decided to run this year for the U.S. Senate seat vacated by Tom Udall, who decided to not run again. Now, CD3 covers most of northern New Mexico, but also Rio Rancho and sections of Albuquerque, as well as a sliver of eastern New Mexico, including Portales and Clovis. Also wrapped up in CD3 are 15 Pueblos, the Hickoria Apache Nation, and parts of the Navajo Nation. Our goal for the next hour is simple, to learn more about the candidates, Republican Alexis Martinez Johnson and Democrat Teresa Ledger Fernandez, and their stance on some of the important issues of the day. The order of our in-depth interviews was decided by a coin flip, and we'll begin with Alexis Martinez Johnson, an oil and gas engineer and rancher. Alexis Martinez Johnson, candidate for the 3rd District of New Mexico. Welcome to New Mexico PBS, our studios. Thank you for having me, Gene. Uh, it's a pleasure. It. Absolutely. Got a series of questions here. Let's get right into it. Um, I, I, I want to start here. The latest approval ratings for Congress is just 21% in the Gallup poll supporting <laughs> Congress right now. Why do you want to serve in the U.S. House of Representatives when public opinion of the body is so low currently? Well, a part of that is not being representative of the people. Mm. And so my campaign and this whole entrance into politics is really to get back to the voice of the people of New Mexico. And I think when we start listening to the constituents in New Mexico and in the other congresspersons districts, we'll start getting closer to what government really should be. Mm -hmm. And that's a servant government, a servant leader. So that is the reason why I got involved. Mm -hmm. um, what will you do to, if you win, to restore confidence in that trust and confidence in your constituents? How, what, what can any one person, one candidate do? Well, I think it's very important mm -hmm. that we listen to everyday New Mexicans, like myself, an everyday New Mexican, come into the community, go into these areas in Navajo Nation, in our Dinet lands, in Clovis, in mm -hmm. Farmington, Rio Rancho, and really listening to the issues that are facing New Mexicans. So as your next U.S. Congresswoman, I would seek to have offices in Las Vegas, in Española, in these areas where we really need to have the voice of the people, mm -hmm. irrespective of special interests and the amount of money that you can put in a race. Uh, those are real obstacles that face New Mexicans getting their voice into policy. Mm -hmm. Now, this won't be news to you, but CD3 has only elected one Republican uh, really in, it, in, it, it, in its existence. It's interesting to think about that. Uh, the district's makeup is 83% more, Demo more Democratic than the U.S. as a whole. If you want to win this race, you have to pull in some of these folks from the other side. What is your strategy for doing so? Well, when you say folks from the other side, mm -hmm. to me, I really represent New Mexicans. So the party of my abuelos, the JFK Democrat, that the home that I was raised in, in New Mexico now, that is going out the door. And so I'm here to restore those traditional family values that I see are fleeting in Santa Fe, in Rio Rancho, and all of the, dish, all of the cities here in New Mexico. Mm -hmm. So I seek to restore, not asking what your government can do for you, but what you can do for your government. Mm -hmm. Um, you've tied yourself fairly closely to President Trump. There's no mm -hmm. uh, secret about that. Does that work for the district? And if so, how, how, do you, how do you square those things? Thank you for that question, Gene. In 2016, when we had the presidential race, I actually voted for Gary Johnson. Mm -hmm. And so when you say, you know, you're tied closely with the president, I am tied closely with the policies that benefit New Mexicans. Mm -hmm. Whoever becomes president, I stand for the interests of New Mexicans, putting the roof over the head, food on the table, educating our children, and having a safe environment to do that. So I do have to disagree when you say that I'm tied closely to the president. I am cl tied closely to policies that create opportunity. And in Congress, as you know, we do not work underneath the president. It's the legislative, executive, and judicial, and we work together. Mm -hmm. Well. On that note, um, has he done a good job with COVID-19? What's your opinion there? 
My opinion is this. When it was controversial to shut down our borders to China and have incoming traffic stopped, mm -hmm. that was very controversial on the onset of COVID. We did not know the severity and China did not provide the information in a timely fashion for us to make decisions that would prevent loss of life in the United States. Mm -hmm. So that closure was controversial, but it did provide a shutdown so that we wouldn't have that transmission rate as high as it could be. Could we do better? We can always do better. In hindsight, we could have acted extremely quickly on, um, on in different areas. But whenever the policies that were put in to create manufacturing between government and private sectors of those ventilators and our much needed private, uh, our proper protective equipment, I think that was key of working together, the government and private industry, mm -hmm. and as an entire United States, working together to rise to the occasion. Can we do better? We always can do better. Mm -hmm. So I look forward to, in U.S. Congress to really coming together, irrespective of party. It's about time that we fight for our values, our united values. What's your opinion of the job Michelle Lujan Grisham has done with COVID-19 here in our state? You know, I am not here to demonize mm -hmm. anyone. And I think the issues that are going on in the United States, we see a lot of, we see a lot of vilifying. So I wanna say that, you know, we are all working together. I think in the areas such as our Navajo, our Dinit lands that had a high presence of COVID, we need to look at that. But areas that had low COVID numbers, mm -hmm. I do not think that they should be completely shut down. I do not agree with shutting down gun stores early on in the COVID situation because that infringes upon constitutional rights. And I believe in that constitution. I believe that the American dream is that of opportunity, that you should be able to provide food on your table even in a crisis. And so when you prevent the American uh, person in low risk areas from doing that, I think that was an issue. A blanket approach for the entire state of New Mexico was not the right approach. So I disagree on shutting the entire state of New Mexico down, shutting constitutional rights down in New Mexico. We have to temper safety with constitutional rights. Mm -hmm. Masks, um, I've got to ask, you were cited in July quite famously uh, for not wearing a mask while you were campaigning on the Santa Fe Plaza. But you're, it seems, and unless I'm missing something, it seems your attitude about masks has evolved a little bit. Help me out with that. What was that situation about in July? And where are you now on masks use in public? Well, I really like what you just said, evolved. Mm -hmm. And that word is key. You know, we have evolved from the onset whenever our government said, you know, we're not gonna wear masks because they wanted to have those N95s for the hospital providers. And then that changed. Over the course of time, we saw that, you know, it's now a norm that we all wear masks. Mm -hmm. And I know that you have seen the newspapers prior to that time in the plaza that I did wear a mask. Okay. And so I wore a mask there. I wear a mask today. When I went to Navajo Nation, I wore a mask and had my hand sanitizer and social distance because those are high risk areas. When I go into my Thea's home and she's over 70, mm -hmm. I put a mask and we social distance. Mm -hmm. But we also need to have compassion and not be hypocritical. New Mexicans don't want to hear about Pelosi not wearing a mask in the salon or Fauci not wearing a mask with his friends in the bleachers. We should stop vilifying individuals and stop politicizing this. We need to acknowledge that there is anxiety and there is fear among all Americans and to understand and have compassion. My sister was walking our children down the block. She's a U.S. veteran of the Marine Corps, served overseas. She had her mask on and was walking my children in a stroller in Santa Fe on the hot, in the hot sun. Nobody was out there. A lady pulled up, rolled down her window, and yelled at the children and my aunt to put a mask on them, and they're two years old. So what I'm saying, Jean, is not that I'm an extremist or I'm irresponsible or anything like this. It's making a statement that says, let's temper our common sense and science with our individual rights. And that was on the eve of July when this mask mandate had come out, er it was early on. Mm -hmm. So I want people to know, I wear a mask, and I think it's pretty, pretty evident on my social media, Alexis Johnson NM, you will see over the course that I have worn a mask. When I take my daughter to the hospital, I wear a mask. And so, you know, I am here to represent New Mexicans. And as I go across New Mexico, people 
do not want to hear about that. They want to hear about how are they going to put food on their table, a roof over their head, educate their children, and have a safe environment. Mm -hmm. So I think that we need to admit that there's anxiety and fear, and we need to come together as a community and not vilify or demonize anyone. Mm -hmm. The conditions on the plaza, it was a hot summer day. The temperatures were high. I was eating a hot dog and, you know, drinking water. Mm -hmm. And really, I'm going to tell you what really occurred. A gentleman on a bench, I said, would you like some material about the campaign? And he was at a distance, and I had some on the table away so people could grab. And he said, I'm a socialist Democrat of America. And I said, okay, sir, is that a communist group? And he was so angry. Mm -hmm. And that's really what we need to stop. We need to allow the First Amendment, irrespective of party, to speak. He got so angry and then two large muscular officers came to me and on the eve of Independence Day on that right. day I felt that we should not use public health orders in a capricious manner in any way you know in that instance it was the same situation that you find in many outdoor eating areas where we're closer to the person than I was on that day in a sparsely populated plaza. Mm -hmm. So the majority of the time, just like Pelosi and Fauci, I wear a mask. Mm -hmm. So I'm thank you for, and I'd love to address this. I'm sure. glad you brought this up. And I the want folks to should here. know you and your staff came into the studios with masks on, into our building, and we appreciate that. And we're pretty masked up around here too, so. Thank absolutely. you very much. Um, quick question here, let's get back to some federal stuff. Do you support the idea of rolling back the Affordable Care Act? There are issues with the Affordable Care Act. Mm -hmm. You know, when we have been told in the past that you could keep your doctor and prices would not be increasing, we saw that those promises were not kept. And in U.S. Congress, I'm there to deliver on those promises. So we definitely need to have affordability. When I take my little girl, my little girl into the doctor, I want to make sure that I have a choice in that doctor, that we work together and make sure that she gets the best care possible and that there's transparency. I don't want to receive a bill and not know what I'm, what I'm paying for. I don't know anything that's bought goods or services in the United States where you don't know what you're paying for. So all of these areas, as well as reducing our prescription drug care health costs. Mm -hmm. You know, we could have manufacturing plants here in Rio Rancho in Farmington to supply some of these much needed uh, drug products for the community that are life saving. We've seen $140 insulin come down to $40. My grandparents who raised me were on insulin every day. And so these are the areas that I'm keenly aware of. Mm -hmm. I do not want to see our Medicare for our elders go anywhere. We need to make sure that they have their health care. Nor do I want to see Medicaid for all of the children that live in conditions where they need to have health care. The environment that I grew up in, humble beginnings. You know, I received a free lunch. You know, those type of, of uh, groups. And what's very important is to understand that when you say Medicare for all, like my opponent, things are not free. I was a little girl raised by my grandparents. And my grandfather, though he was not kin to me, he was an immigrant from Mexico. Mm -hmm. And do you know I received free lunch? And every morning I said, Grandpa, Abuelo, can I have money for pizza? Because I want to be like the cool kids, right? And little did I know, every morning that he put on his uniform and went and dug ditches as an irrigation special, he put the 2 or $3 on the table. Mm -hmm. And he was out there digging ditches another 30 or 40 minutes. And I had no idea. He was trying to show me by his actions mm -hmm. the American dream and opportunity. And that's what I seek to put into the lives of New Mexicans. Mm -hmm. Staying on the ACA, is health care a fundamental human right to you? You know, when you talk about fundamental rights, mm -hmm. when I say to you, Gene, it is my right that you provide this service, you're asking that person, are you asking that person to provide it for free? And when you're asking them to provide it for free, it is really a fairy tale idea mm -hmm. to think that anything in this world comes freely, especially your doctors that have been trained. And we need to provide some type of payment for services. It's a service. Mm -hmm. So I really would like to make sure that all children have a good start in life, just like when I was a little girl make sure they have their immunizations. Mm -hmm. And so I definitely want to work in Congress to make sure that health care is affordable. 
It's a quality care. It's not Medicare for all, where you're gonna see, such as we find at the Department of Motor Vehicle, you're waiting in line, you have no choice, and if Abuela has a, a spot on her arm that needs to be checked, that's six months down the road with Medicare for all. So I wanna make a distinct difference that my opponent is professing extreme progressive views that will hurt New Mexicans. Where, where does, where does uh, let, let, let me put it this way. Mm -hmm. COVID will be around. Let's assume yes. you win and you go into the Congress swearing in. There's gonna be, have to be decisions to be made about Americans and how we fight this thing. Is what you just said square with how we're gonna fight COVID? Meaning, is our healthcare system up to the task of fighting COVID and a, a, a global pandemic. What's your, what's your opinion on there that? There is always room for improvement. Okay. As we've seen in our tribal lands, in Navajo Nation, it is imperative that we work together locally, at the state level, mm -hmm. and on the federal level. We've seen an influx of funds, especially for our Navajo Nation, to make sure that they have ventilators, mm -hmm. so that they had uh, two teams on the ground that had hospitals. This rapid action response is something that we have learned. And if we have another wave of COVID, mm -hmm. I look forward to providing funding, especially to these groups, such as a Navajo Nation and our Pueblos mm -hmm. that really need our support. They've had government run kind of like a Medicare for all system. And we've seen what has occurred in Navajo Nation. Mm -hmm. So I think there's always room for improvement. Working together is key. Will you encourage folks to get vaccinated if and when that time comes? And, and uh, since you brought up the Navajo Nation, would you do the same on the Navajo Nation as we well? We have scientists and engineers like myself. I'm an environmental engineer. Mm -hmm. They are working their hardest right now to make sure that this vaccine is safe. Mm -hmm. So we wanna make sure that all of the areas of safety are covered. And I do promote safety and if we have a vaccine that is safe that they're working for, that that's made available to some of these groups such as your senior citizens and in Navajo Nation that that's available, ready available and available for them. So mm -hmm. I believe in providing uh, the vaccine to these groups. Mm -hmm. You would encourage? I would encourage okay. gotcha. us to do whatever we can to fight this silent war. But mm -hmm. as you know, there are individuals today that cannot take certain vaccines. Right. So we also, as far as requiring, I know that we have different state laws and regulations that would be that would have to go to them in regard to who gets these shots and who uh, can have an exemption, such as if they're allergic to some of the products. Right. So we have to allow for uh, exemptions for persons that are not able to receive vaccines. Mm -hmm. As a member of Congress, how would you help increase wages here for working New Mexicans? Well, here in New Mexico, whenever you say that we're going to require a minimum wage, I think that that really inhibits the small business owner from excelling because you want to pay employees that are doing a great job. Mm -hmm. But if you're just starting out here in New Mexico as a small business and you're required to pay everyone at the same rate, whether it's an entry level or what have you, I think it really prevents that small business from growing. Mm -hmm. So I talk to people in Santa Fe and they say, I only work part time because of that minimum wage. Mm -hmm. You know, so these individuals want to work and we should encourage advancement, but not restrict our small business owners with regulations when in fact, at some points they're not able to meet. Mm -hmm. Um, let's get closer to home here. The federal government um, plans to open up new areas for oil and gas exploration around Chaco Canyon. This has been a controversy, as you know, for, in our state for quite a while now. Um, a lot of opposition, lo local communities are not crazy about it. You know, it, this continues that sort of large gas and oil companies have divested from the San Juan Basin and even analysts or, you know, with global consultant firms are saying, you know, there's things to be done there, certainly, but what are your plans to protect New Mexico's natural and cultural resources and balance that need to find energy sources? And I just love the words that you use because when you talk about balance, that's really what this candidacy is offering. Mm -hmm. It's offering an open door to talk with both groups. In my career, I worked with federal regulators, with the constituents in the community, with environmental groups mm -hmm. to come up with solutions, but sometimes you have environmental edicts come out 
that are not in the best interest of the environment, even though they may think that. And you'll see that there with the spotted owl. Whenever we had the lumber industry closed in the Las Vegas area, we couldn't use our lumber mills. You put New Mexicans out of jobs. Mm -hmm. You have a high density of trees, which can encourage high intensity fires. So while you were protecting uh, the spotted owl, you were actually putting New Mexicans out of jobs. Mm -hmm. New Mexicans out in the cold, quite literally, and creating a situation where high intensity fires could occur. So I'm gonna give that analogy to oil and gas. 39% of our state budget comes from oil and gas. Mm -hmm. It's not only the exhaust, but you know, there in Santa Fe and Taos, when you are on your skis and you go down the slopes, that comes from oil and gas. Those N95 respirators, oh, yeah. polypropylene products of oil and gas. So we have to mitigate negative impacts, and that's what I have done as an engineer. You know, perhaps forest management would have worked better mm -hmm. to, to make sure we have biodiversity. And in the oil and gas industry, let's work together with sustainable sources, yes, but, but let not me ask one you, or the other. When you have local opposition this hard on things like, look, stick it with Chaco. Yes, sir. Um, mm -hmm. How do you, again, how do you balance that? That's a precious area that's not going to come back if it was ever damaged. You know, would, it be, I, would it be worth it? I uh, agree with you mm -hmm. when you say that these areas are precious. Mm -hmm. In New Mexico, and you know, I know very well the cultural diversity, how precious it is. Precious it is. Mm -hmm. These areas are sacred and they are historic. And in no way would my candidacy ever uh, encourage any type of destruction of any site that is means so much to not only our native communities, but everyone here in New Mexico to appreciate. You can utilize engineering mm -hmm. and you can work with the environmental groups and constituents to, you don't have to drill on the top of Chaco Canyon. That is absurd. Mm -hmm. You know, drilling at a distance is fine. Do you know that we have engineers and scientists that can drill horizontally and not be anywhere near these surface cultural sites. So I think we really need to come together and not just say no fossil fuels and not just say all sustainable mm -hmm. and come together. It's really a combination between the two. And as an environmental engineer, I'm keenly aware of these complex issues and bringing solutions for New Mexicans mm -hmm. that still allow for New Mexicans to have jobs, to utilize their land. Mm -hmm. We don't want to have so much government control that we can't graze our cattle, mm -hmm. we can't utilize our acequias, our water. We need to definitely come together uh, as New Mexicans, as Americans. Right. Mm -hmm. How do you view your work for the oil and gas uh, industry alongside your Catholic faith, which is strong, certainly? In its call, particularly noted in Pope Francis's 2015 encyclical, um, to steward both the earth and the poor who often hit hardest by climate change. Do you see what I'm getting at here? You, you, you're, you're with industry, but you have a strong faith. How do, you, how do you meld those two things together? Well, I am very proud to be a God-fearing woman. Mm -hmm. And I do not run on my faith, but I don't run away from it. Okay. You know, I'm a, I'm a God-fearing woman, and I think it's important that we take care of our environment. That's the whole reason I became an environmental engineer, because mm -hmm. I love New Mexico. I love the United States, and I want to see our environment be here for my four children. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we really need to work together, like I've said, and make sure that uh, we have the ability to come up with solutions for the next generation. But I'm not here to take New Mexicans out of jobs to okay. decrease the money that we need so desperately for mm -hmm. our education. And when you say we're going to do away with oil and gas, you're really saying you're going to do away with the much needed education. You know, we've been last, you know, and uh, Ben Ray Lujan's been in here for 12 years and we're, we're still last in many, many areas. Mm -hmm. It's time for term limits, it's time for a change, and it's time for a balanced approach. So I'm very proud of my, of being a, in the Catholic religion. I attend Our Lady of Guadalupe in Santa Fe, and I'm also proud to be a part of the energy sector that has brought not only prosperity to New Mexicans, but let me tell you, it has provided the ability for national security. Mm -hmm. So that when Syria, you know, bombs their own people, men and women, we can say there's a red line and it will not be crossed in regard to human rights mm -hmm. because we have the energy policy that will not cause New Mexican diesel trucks to stop when they need to deliver food. Mm -hmm. You know, we were talking just before we sat down to do this that CD3 is in a fascinatingly diverse district. 
I mean, it really is. When you really think about it stem to stern, it's amazing how any one person could, you know, represent so many different interests. I mean, how would you tell a rancher in the East about a Navajo Nation member and vice versa to help them understand one another? One another? Is that a role that you see that you would play? Yes, and mm -hmm. that is how I won the primary, being outfunded 1 to 11. I took it to the people, and I am a person that is relatable not only because I grew up in humble beginnings, raised by my grandparents, mm -hmm. I was born in the district there in Roosevelt County, but I know what it means to go to Los Alamos and to understand as an engineer the necessity of funding in Los Alamos. I have cattle out there in Harding County. I can speak to the ranchers in Clovis. Mm -hmm. I have a rich history as a Hispanic woman and my abuela always told me, oh, pues mija, you have a Native American in you. And so I carry on those traditions to my children. When I go to Navajo Nation, I have a respect for the cultures of New Mexico. And it's about time we start respecting people mm -hmm. of different voices and different cultures. So I won this race because I am able to listen to my constituents and truly represent their values from Clovis to Farmington to the Hikari Apache Nation, to the small business owners like my family in Rio Rancho. Mm -hmm. And it, the district comes down into the Albuquerque area as yes. well. We we're talking Ventana Ranch, Rio Rancho, a little bit of, of Albuquerque. Is there a different message there for the urban part of your district versus folks in the Roosevelt County and other places you're describing? Well, you'll be surprised. Not only in our tribal nations do they have different issues, but Rio Rancho, Santa Fe, Albuquerque, you go from infrastructure there in Rio Rancho to the need for broadband over there in our Navajo Nation. Right. So it's a very diverse group. Everyone has very different needs from the dairy farmers and the cattle ranchers there in Clovis to their needs to work with the federal government so that they can have a business, mm -hmm. you know, whether that's your meat processing or whether that's your selling of uh, milk. You know, we really need to come together in Congress to make sure that the interests of New Mexicans are taken into account and not just mm -hmm. special interests. Mm -hmm. I will listen to our special interests, but that's not the only voice out there. Right. And we can never forget the forgotten New Mexican. Mm -hmm. Just about a minute left here, I do want to get in. Is there anyone in Congress that you admire? Is there an elected official you watch and say, you know what, I think that man or woman has this right? You know, I admire uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. I do not agree with her policies, okay. but you know what? I admire someone that is bringing the voice of the people. And if her constituents there want that voice, that's fine. Mm -hmm. But I admire young Hispanic women to get involved into politics. And I'm gonna reiterate, even though I disagree with basically all of the policies, it is courageous to get involved in politics, such as myself, not being a politician, not coming from a political family in New Mexico or any type of wealth, mm -hmm. to be the voice of the people. So I encourage women to get involved in politics, and I just want to say rest in peace to our Supreme Court Justice Ginsburg, because that is another woman who broke through, broke through right. barriers, and that is what I'm trying to do here in New Mexico, is bring the voice of the forgotten New Mexican. Alexis Martinez Johnson, thank you for coming down to Albuquerque and talking with us. Really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Absolutely. Our pleasure. Thanks. Yep. Squaring off with Johnson is another political newcomer, Teresa Ledger Fernandez, a Yale educated lawyer. She also served as vice chair of the Council on Historic Preservation under the Obama administration. She surprised some by winning the Democratic nomination over former CIA agent Valerie Plame, who outraised her by a wide margin. She opted to talk to us via Zoom this week because of COVID-19 concerns. Teresa Ledger Fernandez, thank you for joining us. Really appreciate your time. First question, the approval rating for Congress suddenly, uh, suddenly, it stands currently at 21% or even lower in some circles. I have a, a first question, and an obvious question. Why would, do you want to be in the body of the U.S. House of Representatives when the public opinion on the body is so low? Well, what we all need to recognize is that Congress is the place where many important laws that touch so, so much of our everyday life takes, takes place. Um, I'm running uh, 
because everything we love, right? I'm running from a place of love because mm -hmm. everything we love is under attack. Our healthcare, our democracy in this beautiful place we call home. And I really believe that Congress is the place where I could assist in taking bold and courageous action to protect what we love, mm -hmm. especially if you live in New Mexico. The federal government has a major impact on so much of what we do. You know, we receive federal funding for our labs. We have a lot of participation in our military. We have Native Americans. My district is 20% Native American. We have beautiful public lands. We have uh, a lot of poverty. So we receive Medicaid funding, we receive Medicare funding, we receive Title I funding for education. All these things are very important. Mm -hmm. And what we prioritize and what we fund is going to be very important to both how we come out of today's crisis, the pandemic, but also address the other crises, which include um, our climate crisis, which include our need for better education, which include our need for better health care. Those are things that happen in Congress. Mm -hmm. And those are things I need to work on, not because it's popular or unpopular, but because I think I feel called to act, take action on these issues. Mm -hmm. On that point, what would you do to restore confidence in the body? You know, I think that uh, we actually look at some of those polls, there is actually greater confidence in individual elected leaders of Congress, but not in the body itself. Um, so what we need to do is make sure that the elected leaders are open. What I say is this district needs to be represented by somebody who reflects the district, who understands the community very well, who understands its beauty, but also its poverty. So I've worked on issues dealing with poverty as well as opportunity for all these years. So I think that people have, they came out in great numbers. We had overwhelming um, uh, support in the primary as well as greater turnout than we've ever had, historic turnout, right? So people are excited about this election. What we need to do in Congress is get to a point where the House will pass a law, but that the Senate will also take it up and that the president will sign these into law. Right, right now, we have been at a place where the House is passing a lot of very needed legislation. Mitch McConnell in the House is not taking it up. And the president has no interest in making sure that these laws affecting us every day are passed. Look how long it's taken to get uh, COVID relief legislation that we need now. Mm -hmm. uh, House passed it back in May. They've now passed a second one, and we still don't have a Senate or president who are focusing on this urgent issue. So the way it will change is if we can have a Senate um, that is not about obstruction, but is about passing the laws we need. And a president who wants to focus on what are the needs of our country, what are the needs of places like New Mexico, and not just on politicizing everything, right? Mm -hmm. And when we get that, when we actually start doing our business, we are going to uh, regain the trust that people should have in government. Mm -hmm. You declined our offer to have this candidate uh, comparison happen as a debate. I'm curious why. So one of the reasons that uh, we are trying to be very careful and very cognizant of safe COVID practices, right? Uh, and um, we know that even, you know, even with the best uh, precautions, uh, that COVID is still passed. Um, so uh, I really do appreciate you inviting each of us to sit down and have this interview. I am participating in other forums. I think they're more forums rather than debates because mm -hmm. we're sharing our information um, that we're doing so, you know, with separate the same way we are now. I'm sorry I can't be there in um, the studio with you. I know you're taking a lot of care, but we just want to be very respectful mm -hmm. uh, and try to uh, both practice, you know, safe, uh, safe practices. And so that's kind of what we're doing is I am participating in some other what are called debates, mm -hmm. but I'm also, um, you know, participating in these forums, which I think are very good. You know, they're not as great if we could all be on a stand, but that's where we're not at today. Sure. That makes sense. But on that point, interesting uh, news, of course, of President Trump's positive COVID test came in uh, overnight on Thursday, going into Friday morning. I got to imagine you have a fair amount of criticism for the president of how he's handling things, but I'm more curious at this moment, your feelings about our governor, Governor Michelle Lujan Grisham, could she have been different somehow in the handling of this? What's your assessment of how, how she's handled this? So before, since you started with the president's diagnosis, you know, 
my thoughts, and I know many New Mexicans are sending them wishes to get mm -hmm. well, to have a speedy recovery Agreed. for the president, for the first lady, and for all those in the White House mm -hmm. uh, who might have contracted um, COVID during the many events that they've had. As you know, uh, we've had very distinct leadership um, styles and decisions with regards to this. Our governor chose to follow the lead of the scientists, to follow the lead of the experts. And so she has taken the, I, I love the fact that she was ready. She knew it was coming, right? She knew it was coming because we saw it in China. We saw it coming over. She was prepared. So the minute we got our first case, she brought out the expert. She explained to us what we were going to do. And we, we immediately started taking precautionary measures. As soon as you know, the science was clear that we should be wearing masks. She made it a mask mandate. Here in Santa Fe, it became a mask mandate. Mm -hmm. And everywhere, New Mexicans actually support the mask mandate because our values, a New Mexican value, is taking care of each other. And that's what we have been doing when we wear those masks. So I think, you know, nothing's ever perfect. She's been criticized, but boy, has she stayed on message of, what I want to do is make sure that we take care of New Mexicans, regardless of the criticism. So mm -hmm. I am very pleased with what she's done. What's been unfortunate is that it's not a national, a national policy. If it were a national policy, then the two states that we are in between would also have a mask mandate. And maybe as visitors come back and forth, which we want to welcome visitors, maybe we won't be, ex you know, receiving as much of the COVID as we might. Be, right mm -hmm. i would love a national a national policy so every state would look like new mexico mm -hmm. turning it back to the federal government and of course the, the house of representatives um and beyond I, you know there's lots of money going out the federal government has spent billions out there trillions even uh trying to prop up businesses during COVID 19 we all appreciate that but is more money needed for aid or better management of aid programs is there is there a difference there to you both, right? Both? We need okay. both, right? We need both. So right now, uh, Congress just passed the, uh, it's about a $2 trillion uh, HEROES Act, right? right? That aid is so needed. We know that allowing the unemployment to lapse means that a lot of families are now going to face eviction. We've heard about that, right? So we need to get that back in student. We know that our state, local, and tribal governments need money to be able to respond because unlike the federal government, our local governments cannot operate at, with a deficit, right? And so that money is needed. We need money. I loved the fact that there was money in the latest bill for education as well as for uh, for child care, right? So money for child care, so many people can't get back to work without it. That there was, we ran out, look how quickly they ran out of uh, the, the loan program. Mm -hmm. Now this is a place where that could have been managed better, right. right? So it's never an either or. And that's, I think we need to get away from always saying it's an either or, right? Mm -hmm. Both. Right, both because the complexities, we have to be comfortable with nuance and complexities. The complexities are the way that came out. It was said that was going to be for certain kind of businesses and others took advantage of it. One of the things that I'm very critical of is they have delayed funding for Native American tribes. Mm -hmm. And we know those are the hardest hit. And this administration, despite the fact that there was $8 billion available, failed to get all of that out. And right now we've got a court ruling saying, no, there's 500 million that has to get out, but there's two days left, right? That's wrong. We know that, you know, I've been meeting virtually with parents and people from other places up in some of our Pueblos, you know, who depend on the Bureau of Indian Education Schools. They don't have what they need for the students to learn online. The Bureau of Indian Education had the money, mm -hmm. but they didn't spend it and they didn't buy those computers. That's an example of what you talked about, was it needed to be managed better as well. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Um, climate change. I'm curious if you think there's an unpopular step out there that we need to take, a big one, to get after this issue to slow climate change. What would that be? Well, I think that there is going to be more support 
for climate change than we even for addressing climate change than we imagine once we stop having people uh, like many in the Republican Party and like Donald Trump and those who are deniers stop saying, oh, it's nothing. You know, stop putting their eyes in the sand, even as we have New Mexico burn. We don't have forest fires mm -hmm. in August. We have forest fires in June. But that forest fire, you know, my first ad was of me as an Asequia commission and talking about how I bring people together. I don't know if anybody saw it, but it was me with a follow with other uh, Asequia members. Mm -hmm. That fire destroyed the watershed of that Asequia that we relied on. So we need to realize that it is going to hurt every single one of us. New Mexico is one of the most fragile states that will suffer incredible harm if we don't take what might be seen as unpopular, if we don't take strong action to move away from fossil fuels. Some people don't want to do that. They, they want to hold on to it, but it's important for New Mexico. Mm -hmm. Yes, but water is also important for New Mexico. Our future is important for New Mexico. So we need to move to that as quickly as we can. We need to have it be a transition. We need to be able to invest in those communities that are going to, you know, um, that are going to have to suffer through the transition, which means moving, plugging those rails. We have way too much methane going out. We could move people who have the skills needed to drill a well. Let's have them start plugging abandoned wells, which are spewing methane into the air, mm -hmm. uh, which is worsening climate change. So are there are ways in which we can address, tackle this crisis in a way that generates revenues, generates jobs at the same time that it preserves our future on this planet. Gotcha. Um, I wanna stay with wildfires for a bit because it is topical and I'm glad you brought that up because obviously in your district where you're campaigning now, uh, this is a big deal. You know, the lengthening of the fire season's problematic. Uh, the increase in, in, in flooding that follows is problematic. It's going to take money to deal with these issues, too. Um, what other solutions can you name that you favor to deal with this issue that are very specific to your district? With regards to wildfires mm -hmm. itself, we need to make sure that we also fund um, the, you know, the USDA uses, does not get enough funding to actually combat wildfires. So what they have to do is they have to pull from other places. Mm -hmm. So they are basically using up the funding that they would normally have to maybe maintain the fires, to uh, engage in other activities that would be beneficial to our lands. Instead, they have to put that into wildfires. So we need to treat wildfires like the emergencies they are and fully fund them. Uh, we also need, let's face it, if we start taking care of our soil, I had a wonderful, uh, people can go see it on my Facebook Live, I had a wonderful session where we brought together experts around our world development, including ranchers and the Kivita Coalition who are talking about increasing the health of our soil. If we increase the health of our soil um, through good practices, regenerative agricultural practices, good practices on, on, on the earth, we'll be able to retain more water into our soils, which makes us less prone uh, to the very destructive wildfires. So once again, we have to recognize that so much is interconnected. And once we start connecting and fully funding and, and acknowledging um, the relationships, then we will start addressing things like uh, the underfunding, but then we'll also make our sorrows happier and things will grow better, we'll retain better water that will, that will help resist the wildfires. Mm -hmm. uh, different topic. Since 2001, Presidents Bush, Obama, and Trump have used an authorization for use of military force to justify a myriad of military actions out there, a lot of them we all know about. And that authorization, as you recall, was, came after 911 designed to respond to that, meaning there are now men and women serving who weren't even born when it was passed, interestingly. Should Congress end that authorization? And what's your reasoning, if so? Yes, I believe that we should end that authorization so that uh, we can have a careful look at any time we're going to go out and expend, uh, send into battle, you know, the people who serve, my niece serves, uh, and uh, that's her picture back there. Mm -hmm. My niece serves in the military. She flew missions over Afghanistan and Iraq, right? We all know people who are serving. And the last thing we want them to do is to be placed into war for political reasons, for reasons that aren't well thought out. And so we need to, I think, rescind that action. I think 
that Congress needs to take back a lot of its constitutional power, which they have allowed to go. And we have seen during this presidency how that can then be manipulated and, and, and used in ways that nobody would have thought by um, the lengths to which this presidency has acted in ways that are shocking and alarming are numerous. Mm -hmm. And so we need to reinstitute and re-strengthen the idea that we have checks and balances. And Congress needs to pull some of um, their authority back into Congress, which they had been allowing to go out, including uh, in you know this example. But there are my, many others. Mm -hmm. What's your opinion of New Mexico's response to the Yazi Martinez case, which, as you know, um, that the state had not been providing adequate primary education to students in a number of vulnerable categories. What's your thought about how that's been dealt with, talked about, internalized, all of that? How are we doing with, with that situation? So, you know, I should let you know, I uh, was vice chair of the board of MALDEF for six years. MALDEF uh, was the lead attorneys uh, for the uh, the, the plaintiffs with regards to the Spanish speakers and the Latino plaintiffs. Right. Uh, and uh, I represent and work with tribes. And so they're very concerned. And, and I do think I, I, I take my hat off to Judge Sarah Singleton for having the courage to say it's not why right. it's a violation of our constitution to not provide our children adequate education. I have been honest because if anybody goes and looks at what I did at the roundhouse immediately after, uh, I was part of, you know, a small part of many people who were working to have the Yazi Remedies. We call them the Yazi Remedies Instituted. The Yazi Remedies wasn't just give some places a, a uh, um, a little bit more money, but actually we needed to have structural, we need to make structural change. Mm -hmm. We need to put enough money into the training of the teachers. We need to put enough money into providing the resources at the schools where these kids are not getting the instruction that they need. Um, we need to provide more money into those areas where there are the at-risk children. So there is an actual beautiful app, uh, the Yazi Remedies, which people can access on, I believe it's called Transform uh, New Mexico, Transform New Mexico Education. They lay out how that to attack this is not just, we'll put a little more money here and not pay attention, but rather we need to restructure the manner in which we provide education um, so that uh, we address we address these inequities. You know, education needs to be the number one uh, focus of our government. That's the other reason, getting back to addressing the COVID crisis, mm -hmm. we need to make sure that the HEROES Act is passed so that we can provide some federal funding so that New Mexico does not have to cut its education budget. Mm -hmm. That's once again where the federal government can help out the state government to address this need, which we should all be concerned about. Mm -hmm. A big problem for New Mexico, as you know, is broadband coverage. We're a rural state, and of course your district is having its struggles getting broadband coverage. How, what's Congress's role in fixing that, and what is your particular role in making that a better situation? So this is something that I've talked about a lot because I have actually worked on trying to get broadband into rural communities, into tribal, rural tribal communities. Mm -hmm. You know, I was part of a group that uh, brought down grants from the USDA, money grants funds from the USDA under the Community Connect grant. I'm uh, familiar with the E-rate, which would take broadband to uh, libraries. Our problem is these programs have not been widespread enough. Mm -hmm. and, and we know, and then the consequences of that boom, right, they came out with COVID, where people can't, children can't go uh, to school online because they don't have access to broadband, where people can't go, I mean, I can work because I'm in Santa Fe, although even in Santa Fe, it goes on and off, right? Sure. Um, but, where, but I can work and, and campaign from my house, um, but in too many places of New Mexico, you can't do that. Telehealth, we cannot have, people can't access telehealth. I think, so that was one question is, I believe this is a huge need. One of your questions was, what should Congress do about it? I believe that the federal government and the state governments, that what government's job is to provide the infrastructure upon which our communities can thrive, our businesses can thrive, right? And what is one of the key parts of our infrastructure we need to 
um, understand that broadband in the 21st century is a key part of our infrastructure. So I believe that we need to fully fund it as part of our infrastructure funding. When we get to Congress in 2021, uh, seeing, what, seeing how the Senate's not taking up the COVID relief, we are gonna need to do a big, big bill to take us out of the recession. That bill, I can talk more about it, but that bill must have the funding we need for infrastructure, for 21st century infrastructure, including broadband. But we also know New Mexico still doesn't have a lot of good 20th century infrastructure, so we still need to fund that as well. Good way to put it, <clears throat> appreciate that. Uh, President Obama appointed you vice chair of his advisory group on historic preservation. Interesting, in the context of statues and monuments that we have going now. There's a recent journal poll found huge opposition in your district to replacing monuments uh, to, of uh, Juan de Oñate. How do you think cities like Albuquerque, Santa Fe, Alcalde should handle these statues and monuments? Is there a correct way? I think that, you know, I've been pleased at what I've been reading about the manner in which Albuquerque has been doing this. Right? And, and it comes from something I've done a lot throughout my career, which is bring different people together to discuss, you know, difficult issues. But if we do it with respect, with understanding, then that's how we get to solutions. You're right. You know, I was the vice chair of the Advisory Council on Historic Preservation, which advises both Congress and the administration on issues of cultural and historic preservation. My job, it wasn't my job, but th something I took on because I think it's important was the need to make sure we had everybody's history, everybody's stories included in the American story because too often Latinos and Native Americans and Asian Americans and Black Americans, their contributions mm -hmm. to this country have been left out. And so when we think about the statutes, we need to remember that we have groups and communities which want to make sure that their history is reflected and what is shown around them. I was the president of La Compañía de Teatro de Albuquerque. And, you know, we did work to make sure that, you know, Latinos were not on the stage. Our plays were, nobody was talking about us. We weren't being shown. And so we wanted, you know, what we did, we took it upon ourselves. We, you know, started doing bilingual plays. We started doing Spanish language plays. We played, did plays by Rodolfo and I and others. So there was a need to be seen and to be heard. But now that we're at this moment that says, but maybe everything in that history is not, you know, roses, but there are difficulties, there's trauma, but to address how we do it, we must do it in conversation. Mm -hmm. We must do it in bringing us together. The fact that I've worked with Native Americans as their counselor and as somebody who's protected many a sacred site, that I've done Latino cultural preservation, Latino cultural expression. You know, I think I understand the need to bring us together to have this conversation about what should we do about these monuments and about our understanding of our diverse cultural differences, mm -hmm. our ability to celebrate each other and so forth. So that's how I think we need to do it is through conversation, through dialogue, bringing people together so we come to a common understanding. Mm -hmm. What do you say to those who say that removing statues removes history? Is there a way to get dialogue between those folks and those who do wanna keep statues and monuments? Is there a middle ground there and can a representative be that broker? Yes, absolutely. There's a random ground and that's our job. Our job isn't to stoke the anger on either side. Right, right now, what we see a lot of people doing is using this moment to stoke anger, to stoke division, right? To stoke, uh, <clears throat> no, our job is to bring people together and to be honest about that historical trauma. And they say, but how do we make sure that we don't obliterate your history either? How do we make sure that we recognize, you know, that you have, you know, lots of wonderful contributions that Latinos and Hispanos have wonderful contributions. Okay, can I do something silly here? The tamale. <laughs> the tamale, I don't know, but you know, the tamale I think is such a great thing. You know, I, I make tamales, my family makes tamales. Well, I make really good tamales, uh, because we've been making them in my family forever, right. but also because I represent Preblos and they told me, they gave me their secrets of how to make them good. But you look at the tamale, it's got corn and chile, which are part of the new world, right? But boy, that pork and the chili is tasty, right? <laughs> so, you know, there are so many things that we have in New Mexico that actually represent a building together of, you know, the two cultures and, you know, 
that's a little lighthearted, but you get the sense, right, that there are ways in which we can celebrate the contributions that each of each the uh, each of the different communities and people who come in afterwards, the Anglo's, you know, mm -hmm. the many different minority groups who've come into New Mexico and the contributions they've done. We need to learn how to celebrate it at the same time that we d we do what you said, which is let's look at how we address both of those mm -hmm. in conversation, even though it might not be easy conversation to have. Mm -hmm. We have a minute and a half to go here. I'm curious, is there a member of Congress that you admire that you've watched over the years? And what, have, what specifically did you enjoy about them? Well, I am gonna stay close to home. I have been so impressed with Congresswoman Deb Holland. Mm -hmm. And I'm talking about her because, you know, with regards to me, you know, we will be uh, an, uh, if, if when we if I win and if so she wins and Deb wins, we'll be an all woman of color delegation, um, you know, and I have seen how she got there. She got elected to leadership. She's getting bills passed. She's working with everybody. I mean, it's really impressive. Um, and, uh, you know, I've been very impressed with, with what she's done. Um, and so that would be one way. And then, you know, New Mexico has had a long history of very, very effective members of Congress, you know, Senator Chavez, oh my God, right? Thank heaven for Senator Chavez. We have, he helped Latinos and Hispanos get into law school when, you know, we were having problems back here. He got them into Georgetown. Those were our founders of those who first came before. He did so many things, so we can go back. Did you know that the suffragist, uh, Alvina Warren Soto was our, she was one of the earliest suffragists uh, from New Mexico, and she was the first Latina to run for Congress. Teresa Ledger Fernandez, we thank you so much for your time. Good luck on the campaign trail. Well, thank you very much. Thanks for hosting me. It's our pleasure. We thank you for watching this election 2020 special, a conversation with the candidates for the third congressional district. We invite you to tune in this coming Thursday, October 8th, when we sit down with the candidates in the 1st Congressional District. Also, watch on air and online Sunday, October 18th at 6 p.m. for our debate with the candidates in the U.S. Senate race. And a reminder to follow all of our local election coverage at NewMexicoInFocus.org. You can also keep up on all the national news with the PBS NewsHour. Just head to NMPBS.org. A reminder, early in-person voting starts on October 17th here in New Mexico. Absentee voting begins tomorrow, October 6th. We encourage you to vote and to be as safe as possible while you're making your voice heard at the polls.